Hello, KIN163 students. Um, this is again the same chapter from your nutrition book that is listed on the uh, slide here, Rawson, Branch, and Stevenson. Um, and this is the part two of the two series lecture. We talked about the energy systems on part one. Now I'm going to talk about the metabolism here on part two. The outline of this uh, lecture, we're going to discuss the, it includes the metabolism first, we're going to discuss what it is, and then we're going to discuss the energy metabolism at rest, um, how, how and when and what uh, we are expanding during rest, and then we will discover what goes into, what components goes into the total daily energy expenditure of an individual at rest. And then we're going to talk about energy metabolism during exercise. And then finally we will cover the fatigue. What is metabolism? It is the sum total of all physical and chemical changes that take place within the body. Okay? So the transformation of food to energy, the formation of new compounds such as hormones and enzymes, the growth of bone and muscle tissue, the destruction of body tissues, and a host of other physiological processes are parts of the metabolic process. process. Metabolism involves two fundamental processes. One is called anabolism, and the other one is called catabolism. Anabolism is a building up process or constructive metabolism, just like this chain. You put the little small pieces together to make up a whole. That's called an anabolism, and making up new muscle tissue is an example for that. Catabolism is the exact opposite, means tearing down process or disintegration of body compounds. So if this is a glycogen, we're going to break it down into smaller pieces and finally make it a glucose so that we can use it up during exercise for our energy needs. So um, um, the energy released from some catabolic processes is used to support the energy needs of anabolism. So they go hand in hand, and both of them will constru uh, construct the metabolism. Metabolism is life, actually. So we take the energy from sun by eating food and convert it into ATP, and then we use it for energy. And again, that cycle goes on and on until we die. So we're going to focus on... Um, to how much, how many calories we're going to spend during a given day. That is called total daily energy expenditure. And there is two compo three components that goes into this formula. Um, the first one is called basal energy expenditure. We're going to cover them in detail in the later um, part of this lecture. And the second portion is TEF or thermic effect of food and the final which is the most variable because it depends on how much exercise you have in a day is the thermic effect of exercise so the calories that you spend for your basal metabolism the calories that you spend to process the food that you eat and the calories that you spend uh, for the exercise that you do. If you look at these numbers on the right side, you will realize that the majority comes from your basal energy expenditure, 7 to 5%. And then 5 to 10% comes from the processes uh, that your body go, goes through to process the, the food that you eat so that it get, gets metabolized and uh, produces energy. And the final is, again, this is the most variable, 
it depends on the individual and how much exercise that they incorporate into their daily lives, 15 to 30 percent. Okay, the first component in circle, basal energy expenditure. This is what we're going to cover with this slide. There's too much material, but I want you to understand them individually. The first one we're going to look at by definition is basal metabolic rate. I don't want you to be confused with all these uh, ter terms that we use for uh, how much energy we spend during rest or at rest. Uh, so I will go over them one by one. The first one is basal metabolic rate. So if we read this, this is the energy required to maintain physiological processes in a resting, post-absorptive, meaning you just ate the food, processed it, and absorbed it, okay? Um, this one, um, other than sleeping, it is the lowest rate of energy expenditure during the day. Well, the determination of this uh, BMR is a clinical procedure. As you can see, it says it requires, when you want to measure this number, it requires 12-hour fast and you have to be in a reclined position. So since it, is, uh, it requires a laboratory or hospital setting, um, it is really not practical to use in our case. The, the person needs to be fasted for 12 hours, then with the person in a reclining position, their oxygen consumption is measured. Remember, we measure the oxygen to be able to see how, mu how many calories that person is spending at that given time. So that's called basal metabolic rate, okay? So it's a rate per minute so we convert that or extrapolate uh, in for 24 hours to find basal energy expenditure okay so just to be alive just to survive your organs keep working your heart your lungs and your muscles brain everything is just uh, keeping the homeostasis just for you to stay alive that's your the definition of basal, okay, vital. Then we come to the resting metabolic rate. This is slightly higher than the basal metabolic rate because it is taken at a given time during the day while we assume that you are rested. But this, into this rate, there goes uh, energy associated with eating. You might have just eaten before you come to um, measure your resting metabolic rate and you basically walked into the lab or wherever you're measuring your RMR so there is some additional energy associated with previous muscular activity as well so that's why resting metabolic rate is going to be a slightly um, higher number than your basal metabolic rate. Then we just extrapolate that RMR to find the REE or resting energy expenditure to find it um, um, in what it is in 24 hours which is a day. So those numbers are relatively close to one another um, with the resting metabolic rate slightly higher we're just we're just going to use REE and BEE interchangeably for the sake of this course. So we can estimate our resting energy expenditure with a very simple rough estimation, estimation formula, which is we assume that we are spending just one calorie or big calories or kilocalories per kilogram of body weight per hour. Okay, so one kilocalorie per kilogram of body weight per hour. For example, if you weigh 150 pounds, we just convert it to kilograms by dividing this number by 2.2, and then it gives us 68 kilograms. And just to find what 
our daily resting energy expenditure is we multiply that by 24 hours since there are 24 hours within a day and this is roughly an estimation of this person's uh, rest energy expenditure 1632 kilocalories per day so these are important slides for you to understand why because basal energy expenditure or rest energy expenditure constitutes the majority of the total daily energy expenditure as discussed previously with 60 to 75 percent we will spend most of our focus on discussing what factors potentially could affect our resting energy expenditure there are factors that we cannot change like genetic factors so those are the ones that you see on the slide now the genetic factors uh, starting with the body composition um, assumes that your resting energy expenditure is directly related to the amount of metabolically active tissue you possess what what, what does that mean um, at rest tissues such as heart liver kidneys and other internal organs are more metabolically active than muscle tissue but muscle tissue is more metabolically active than fat so changes in the proportion of these tissues in your body will therefore cause changes in your REE. Individuals with naturally greater muscle mass in comparison to body fat have a higher resting energy expenditure. The second one is related to sex. So the resting energy expenditure of women is about 10 to 15 percent lower than that of men mainly because women have a higher proportion of fat to muscle tissue and the age Unfortunately, as we get older our rest energy expenditure drops uh, because infants have a large proportion of metabolically active tissue and are growing rapidly their resting energy expenditure extremely high the REE declines through childhood adolescence and adulthood as full growth and maturation are achieved genetically lean individuals have a higher REE than do stocky individuals because their body surface area ratio is larger in proportion to their weight which brings me to number four and they lose more body heat through radiation so if you have a larger body size uh, having more surface area with the environment then you will have um, higher resting energy expenditure and la lastly natural hormonal activity also affects um, RE REE the hormones that are directly related to metabolism such as thyroid insulin leptin ghrelin etc and their natural secretion activity due to varying genes could also change REE positively or negatively. So these are the factors that you cannot change um, and they are inherent uh, to your body. And the second one are the behavioral and situational factors again affecting REE uh, the symbols that you see on the left side of every item uh, is going to tell you the correlation between the factor and the REE so if you see a negative number that means losing body weight is negatively correlated with REE that means losing body weight including both body fat and muscle tissue uh, regardless generally lowers the total daily resting energy expenditure in contrast maintaining normal body weight while reducing body fat as discussed in the previous chap uh, uh, slide and increasing muscle mass may raise the REE slightly because muscle tissue has a somewhat higher metabolic level than fat tissue 
or because the ratio of body surface area to body weight is increased. Okay, so the second one is diet, but we're mainly focusing on very low calorie diets. If you are on very low calorie diet, diets, um, your resting energy expenditure will be decreased significantly, especially in obese individuals who go on a very low calorie diet of less than 800 calories per day. The decrease in the REE, which is greater than would be due to weight loss alone, may be caused by lowered levels of thyroid hormones, but it's a maybe. There is more research. Uh, there should be more research done on this topic. And and the research is taking place as we speak. The third one is smoking cigarettes. As you see, there is a plus sign that means it's positively correlated with REE. It raises the REE. Uh, apparently, the nicotine in tobacco stimulates the metabolism similarly to caffeine. So it's a stimulant and it increases your resting energy expenditure. This may be one of the reasons some individuals gain weight when they stop smoking. A long time ago, cigarettes were advertised on major radio shows as a means to lose weight, although some may still smoke cigarettes for, for weight control purposes. Such practices are strongly discouraged given the many associated adverse health effects. The next one is, again, related to stimulants like caffeine and others, and there's a plus sign. Whenever you see a stimulant, it's going to increase your resting energy expenditure. Uh, one study reported that the caffeine in two to three cups of regular coffee increased the REE by 10 to 12 percent. Hot spicy foods such as hot peppers can also exert a modest stimulant effect on the metabolism. There, and that's why some of the dietitians um, advise their clients to use more hot peppers in their diets. And the last one is the pregnancy. Again, there is a plus sign. Uh, pregnant women, as opposed to non-pregnant women, will have a raised resting energy expenditure. And the final, um, category about the factors affecting REE is the environmental factors. So climatic conditions, especially temperature changes, okay, may also raise the resting energy expenditure. So exposure to the cold, uh, the second one, may stimulate the secretion of several hormones and muscular shivering, which may stimulate heat production up to 400% to help us stay warm. So it's going to increase your REE. And likewise, exposure to warm or hot environments will increase energy expenditure through greater va cardiovascular demands. When it's too hot, you want to get rid of the sweat that is produced by your body. So you breathe more or your heart rate goes up. That's the cardiovascular responses. Therefore, your sweat rate goes up to get rid of the extra heat that your body is generating in a hot environment. Therefore, your resting energy expenditure goes up too. When you are also exposed to high altitude, um, you will be craving for oxygen since the, um, the amount of oxygen will be um, less um, relatively not the amount, but the ratio of oxygen will be less, so you'll be craving for oxygen and you will increase your ventilation, breathing rate, and that's going to increase your resting energy expenditure. So when we look at the energy sources at rest, sources meaning what kind of fuels our body prefers during rest. When we talk about fuels, what we mean is, do we prefer carbohydrates? Do we prefer fats to produce the energy needed by our body at rest? So the vast 
majority of the energy consumed during a rest situation is used to drive the automatic physiological processes in the body, as we know. Because the muscles expend little energy during rest, there is no need to produce ATP rapidly, as we looked at it in the part one lecture. So uh, the oxygen system will be able to provide the necessary ATP for resting physiological processes. Therefore, the oxygen system will be dominating at rest. Don't forget that. And when they break it down into the fuels, they found out that the majority for an average person uh, will be coming from fats. Since you are slow, you don't need the energy as, as rapidly as you would be exercising. So 60% of the energy comes from fats and 40% uh, of the total energy comes from carbohydrates. As we know, protein is not used as a major energy source under normal dietary conditions. And the diet. Uh, diet is um, also a good factor or a, a significant factor to, for your body to determine what sources, energy sources, it will use um, at rest. So eating a diet rich in carbohydrates or fat will respectively increase energy derived from carbohydrate and fat. So if you ate a diet that is rich with carbohydrates such as pasta, then you, at rest, not during exercise, um, at rest, uh, the majority of your energy will be provided by breaking down carbohydrates, not fat, and vice versa. And when the carbohydrates levels are low, such as after an overnight fast, your storages are really low, the percentage of the REE dried from fat increases. Therefore, when you exercise in the morning after an overnight fast, the majority of the energy will come from fat instead of carbohydrates. But you, the performance, your performance will suffer since carbohydrates will provide you with the fast energy. Since those are low and you're generating your energy mainly from fat, your performance will um, require you to be slow. That's why uh, most um, exercise specialists will recommend walking after an overnight fast for their clients to lose weight. Now, our focus is the second component, which constitutes 5 to 10% of overall daily energy expenditure, which is the thermic effect of food. So by definition, it's the energy required to absorb, transport, store, and metabolize the food that you just ingested by increased body heat. So when your body is increasing heat, that means it's producing more, I mean, uh, it's spending more energy, what, like we learned in the first part of this lecture. So this um, calorie uh, amount will be highest approximately one hour after a meal. And uh, when you look at the breakdown for each uh, nutrient, protein will be the highest um, thermic effect of food calories and followed by carbohydrates 5 to 10 percent and fat it has minimal effect on the energy that you um, you spend or expend through this component in a day. Again, now our focus is the third component, thermic effect of exercise which constitutes 15 to 30 percent of overall daily energy expenditure, as discussed earlier, depending on the individual's physical activity levels. So that's the energy you spend during your exercise or physical activity. There's going to be a lot of factors going into how many calories you burn during exercise 
and what kind of fuels you burn during exercise, which is going to be the focus of the next slides. So how can we measure the energy cost if we break it down into those three systems that we just learned? When it comes to ATP PCR system, which is the quickest one, as you remember, phosphocreatine system, system or phosphagen system, measuring the energy cost is not common because it requires muscle biopsy. You cannot tell if you are depleted or if you used up all your ATP and PCR stores, so that's not very common. When it comes to lactic acid system, we can easily um, figure out if we are relying on lactic acid system during exercise by measuring the blood lactate levels with a certain kit that is used with, for exercise physiology research studies um, by measuring the, the lactate levels uh, in your blood by taking a small blood sample. And the oxidative system is uh, commonly used because when, like we discussed in the first part, when we measure VO2 means the volume, uh, V means volume of gases. So here the gas is oxygen. If we can measure the volume of oxygen that is being consumed during that specific exercise, we can tell how much of an energy that ex exercise is spending. So there are different ways that we can express the energy cost of exercise. So the first one is kilocalories. As you typically know, we are curious about how many calories we burn during a specific exercise. Also another unit of measurement that we use is kilojoules, international measure, and then just like we discussed, oxygen uptake or VO2, volume of oxygen that is being consumed, the oxygen consumed for the exercise. And very practical way of measuring or expressing the energy cost of exercise is met. We will discuss it in the uh, next uh, slide, but it's basically the multiples of your resting metabolic rate. If you look at the conversions, don't memorize them, uh, but just for your own interest, one kilocalorie is equal to four kilojoules. One liter of oxygen that you consume will be equal to five kilocalories. And I want you to know this one in red, one meta met. Met is a metabolic equivalent and defined as the energy expenditure at rest. And it's equal to roughly, approximately, and this number might change uh, through re more research, but now it is accepted as 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram of body weight per minute okay so it's only the amount of calories or oxygen that you use per minute per kilogram of your body weight so if you are a 70 kilo uh, individual you're roughly spending 1.25 kilocalories per minute at rest okay so one met is used as a reference for resting condition and multiples of it is used to indicate the difficulty of the exercise. And I highly encourage you to go and look for this compendium of physical activities on, on the internet because it's going to tell you how many met is for a given exercise. Here is example an example from your textbook. So at rest, um, we're spending one met. We are, we are at a difficulty of one met. The person sitting, one met. If you want other units of measurements, you can look at them, but I'm gonna mainly focus on the mets. So it's the easiest one. It's mo it, it just, you just use the multiples of it to figure out what the energy cost of, your, of the exercise that you are engaging in. So slow walk, 
two miles per hour. It's very easy walk, walking around the house, two to three mets, depending on your speed. Fast walk, if you are, you know, pumping your arms, taking a walk outside after dinner, it's equal to six to seven mets. And then if you run um, approximately at eight miles per hour speed, it's equal to 10 times of resting, 10 to 12 times, depending on your speed again. So what are the factors that affect energy cost of exercise? In other words, what is it going to affect how many calories I'm going to be spending through my exercise? The first and the most important one is the exercise intensity. In other words, if you are engaged in cardiovascular exercises, it's the speed, okay? It's highly correlated, positively correlated with the energy cost. If you are going at um, higher intensities or higher speeds, you're gonna be burning more calories. The second one, again, positively correlated is exercise duration. Dose real and um, um, result relationship, dose and effect relationship. So if you do more or longer times, you're going to be spending more energy. The negative one is going to show you the correlation, negative correlation. When this increases, the energy cost will be decreasing. So the efficiency of movement or economy, or in other words, um, in the research, uh, world. We also use that as running economy, but of course it depends on the sports or activity that you're dealing with. Uh, so if your efficiency of movement gets better, uh, if you're not all over the place when you're running, for example, with your arms, if you have the best form, then your energy cost will drop. Okay, so the athletes by nature will be preserving their energy by being skillful or efficient in their sports. The fourth one, again, a positive correlation, <coughs> excuse me, is the size of your body. If you have a bigger body, then you're going to spend more energy, regardless of the composition. In other words, regardless of you having more fat or more muscle. Just the size will increase the energy cost of exercise. So, this is interesting. Does exercise affect my resting energy expenditure? Yes, it does. So, inherently, there is a, a concept called metabolic after effects of exercise. Um, let's say you're spend. I'm just making up these numbers just for simplicity purposes. So let's say you're just spending one calorie a minute by just sitting here. You went and did um, an exercise. Let's say you just ran for 30 minutes. You came back and you just sat in front of your computer. Now you're spending 1.5. Okay. Just again, for simplicity, I'm just making up these numbers, but that's what I'm trying to say. Exercise will raise the metabolic rate during exercise, but also keeps the REE elevated during recovery. That's a benefit. So you'll end up spending more calories than what you just spent during exercise. Increase in body temperature and the amounts of circulating hormones such as adrenaline will con continue to influence some cellular activity. That's why your metabolism will be higher. Also circulation and respiration will remain elevated for a limited time. There is still research being done on how much time, but now we know that it is gonna remain elevated. And another concept that I want you to remember is called EPOC, or Excess Post-Exercise Oxygen Consumption. It's the amount of oxygen in excess of the pre-exercise resting energy expenditure measured during recovery after the exercise task. 
So, like we said, we measure the oxygen to figure out how much energy you're spending. If we were to compare the amount of oxygen you're spending before exercise and after exercise, we will see an elevation or excess oxygen consumption. And this number, or RMR, remains elevated after intense exercise such as high intensity interval training. There is um, an important amount of research that has shown that this uh, concept um, is, is pretty much valid for all high intensity in, uh, interval trainings. Extra caloric expenditure above resting metabo metabolism may be the modest, but may add up over time. Okay, now we're going to discuss what kind of nutrients will fuel your exercise. Okay, in other words, what energy sources will be used during exercise and factors affecting this phenomenon. So. Your body will decide if it's going to burn carbohydrates or fats to generate the energy needed for your exercise, depending on the intensity and the duration. We will discuss that in the next slide. So exercise intensity and duration is a major factor affecting what nutrients will be provided to um, generate at, at the ATP. The other factor is hormones. Insulin, catecholamines, which is a stress adrenaline and nor epinephrine and norepinephrine, in other words, adrenaline, and the cortisol, which is a stress hormone, they're all released during exercise, okay? And if there's insulin, that's an anabolic hormone, um, that puts the glucose together into glycogen. So these hormones will affect what nutrients will be used. But um, the main idea here is if you're under stress, you'll be depending or relying on carbohydrates more than the fat. And in, in the fitness level, the initial fitness level of the individual will also determine, or, or, or not just the initial fitness level, but overall fitness level will determine if uh, the individual will be uh, sparing their mus muscle glycogen or not. If you're a fit individual, you'll end up sparing your muscle glycogen for later use and burning more fat. There are studies who have shown this fact. Okay, so this slide will talk about the uh, specific nutrient. So when you look at ATP PCR system, um, we are relying on that system and ATP and phosphocreatine in all out exercises lasting one to 10 seconds. And when we look at the lactic acid system, again, it has to be an intense exercise lasting half a minute to two minutes to, to use your lactic acid system, um, hence your carbohydrates. An oxidative system which uses carbohydrates and fats uh, are used or, yes, are used as fuels to fuel your mild to moderate exercises lasting five minutes plus. So again, I want you to take away this message from this slide. As intensity increases, the greater your reliance will be on carbohydrates. Or if your hormones are on the stress uh, side, or if your body is on a high gear, if you will, if you are um, in that fight or flight response, or if you are you just started exercising and your body is increasing its stress hormones in, in your bloodstream, you, you're, again, your reliance on carbohydrates will be greater. So just to 
review what fields we have talked about so far for the ATP PCR energy system. We use adenosine triphosphate, which is your ATP that is stored in the muscle, and phosphocreatine, again, stored in the muscle. And lactic acid energy system, we you only use carbohydrates, don't forget that. Uh, and it's primarily the muscle glycogen rather than your liver glycogen stores. And in the oxidative energy system, everything, muscle, liver, glycogen, blood, glucose as carbohydrates, you can oxidize those. And all the other fats, muscle, blood, adipose tissue, triglycerides, and blood-free fatty acids. Well, proteins, again, they are minor sources of energy in, in the form of am amino acids, but they're not um, used um, in general, um, depending on your diet status. So these are examples of exercises or physical activities that last 10 seconds, 2 minutes, and 10 minutes. So 10 seconds, it's very high intense and short duration, um, quick bursts of energy will be relying on anaerobic systems, 85%, and 15% will be aerobic. Again, I'm just going to remind you here, these energy systems are not exclusively mutual. They just work together, okay? But we are still not sure perfectly the breakdown of these. These are rough estimations. The majority, you should just understand, comes from your anaerobic energy systems, and the minority will be coming from your aerobic energy systems. When you look at a two-minute exercise, it's going to be a breakdown of 50-50. And when the exercise gets longer in duration, like a 10-minute jog or a walk or a run, the majority will be coming from your aerobic resources and the minority will be coming from anaerobic resources. This is a table that summarizes the main energy source for these specific um, energy systems, intensity levels, rate of ATP production. Of course, we know that the rate is going to be the highest for the ATP PC and lowest for the oxygen when you oxidize fat. Power production, capacity for total ATP production. Capacity is lowest, of course, because we cannot store uh, high amounts of ATP in our muscles. And highest for the fat because it's abundant. Endurance capacity, lowest. Here, it, it doesn't last you for long. The sustainability is lowest, and the sustainability of the fat oxidative system is the highest. Oxygen needed, we now know. We don't need oxygen for the ATP, PC, lactic acid, and we do need the oxida oxygen for oxidative systems. And anaerobic aerobic breakdown, and the track events, you don't have to know, but the Time factor, 1 to 10 seconds for ATP, PC. Lactic acid, 31, 20 seconds. 5 minute plus oxid oxygen system, carbohydrates, and hours unlimited for oxygen system coming from fat. Okay, here is an interesting slide to discuss. This is my favorite because um, I would like to debunk this idea with you here by showing you the graphs um, and um, totally um, proving you that this is a myth. What is the fat burning zone? So when you see some of the fitness related internet sites or the exercise equipment that you use in the gym, they're trying to tell you that you should train in the fat burning zone for fat loss because you're burning more fat. As we now know, I'm com going back here, we're going to be relying on our uh, oxidative system more when we go slow and long, right? 
okay but this is a percentage we're going to have to focus on absolute numbers going back to the slide again the exercise intensity needed to get into this zone is most often low intensity because it has to last longer only 40 to 50 percent of your maximum heart rate so it's basically half of your capacity even less than that so if you're capable of running for example they're going to tell you no don't run you should be walking so you burn more fat well they're totally wrong but also right because there's a little trick here if you look at the percentage yes the majority of your energy will be coming from fat in a percentage wise but if you look at the total amount of calories that's not true that is totally wrong so the best recommend recommendation for most exercises who want to achieve a healthy body weight and improve their fitness is to exercise at the highest intensity which is appropriate for their age health motivation that's something that's another topic to cover safety but if they can afford going at their highest intensity that's the best way to improve their fitness and maintain a good body weight especially if they want to lose fat so the total as you can see that's in red caloric expenditure during exercise is the key to promote weight loss I'll show you in a graph soon exercising in the fat burning zone may be very appropriate for some individuals of course such as those beginning an exercise program the elderly and others in the with the condition that when once they become more fit they should be bumped uh, like we talked about in the progressive overload principle principle so here is an interesting uh, graph if you look at the first one they're showing you the breakdown of fat which is uh, uh, the hollow box with the green um, borderline and the carbohydrate is the green box okay but that's the breakdown of total calories uh, for walking two miles per hour very low intensity oops exercise okay as opposed to running nine miles per hour and this is the percentage from zero to hundred percent if you walk two miles per hour with a, a speed of two miles per hour so the majority of the energy will be coming from burning fat and the minority will be coming from burning car carbohydrates when you look at here running the majority will be coming from carbohydrates and the minority will be coming from fat but this is only the breakdown of the calories but we still don't know how many calories we burn now the second one is showing you the absolute numbers the total amount of calories you burn yes uh, the majority of the total amount of calories that you burn during walking at a two mile, miles per hour speed will be coming from fat but if you look at the total amount of calories you'll be uh, spending less than 100 kilocalories per let's say 30 minutes because these are uh, comparable uh, exercises both of them in terms of duration and the second one running nine, nine miles per hour the total amount of calories is almost equal to 500 maybe more and the majority comes from carbohydrates let's say 390 or 400 and 100 comes from fat but in the end this is even less than 100 if you just compare the absolute fat amount that you just burned during that 30 minutes it's still less in terms of the absolute number than this uh, but in terms of the total amount of calories that you burn during those 30 minutes you end up burning more than 500 here and you end up burning less than 100 here 
So it's up to you, but the, the recommendation, going back to the previous slide, is the highest intensity. So there are other factors affecting energy sources during exercise. The hormones, insulin, catecholamines, cortisol, which will end up burning more from carbohydrates. Initial fitness level, uh, again, since it, if you are a less fit individual and you just start in an exercise program, you will be relying on carbohydrates more than fat. Dietary factors, so what you eat. If your carbohydrate stores are full in your body, your body will uh, pr uh, uh, prefer burning from carbohydrates more than fat and what you just ate before your workout and time of eating, composition of meal will again uh, be very relevant um, to what you just ate. Um, so what you burn during exercise will be uh, relevant to pre-exercise meal. And also food eaten during exercise, if you let's say um, take Gatorade, which has carbohydrates in it, which is a, a direct uh, supplement to your blood glucose levels. Of course, you're going to end up burning those because that's the most, the quickest way of generating energy. And some drugs, caffeine, uh, any stimulants in your body will increase uh, burning carbohydrates. And the final concept to cover for this chapter is fatigue. Uh, we're not going to talk about chronic fatigue, um, which is discussed in, the, in this chapter in your textbook, but for the sake of this class, since we're interested in the fitness portion, I'm not going to cover the chronic acute, which is a health uh, condition. We will just look at the acute fatigue that is caused by depletion of your energy resources. So the, by definition, it's the inability to continue or sustain exercising at a desired level of intensity okay you will still be able to continue exercising as you know that your fat resources are abundant you never have to stop exercising because you depleted your ATP PCR stores or um, muscle glycogen stores you still have fat to keep you going but of course the intensity has to come down we now understand that if we cannot burn our carbohydrates anaerobically, we have to slow down. So ATP PCR, uh, very intense, we know, exercise lasting 5 to 10 seconds. The fatigue is going to be caused by depletion of phosphocreatine. And um, you can always um, stop completely if you're working out this way with very intense bouts of exercise uh, sessions and take a break for three to five minutes which will replenish your phosphocreatine stores you don't have to take a creatine supplementation in the meantime or before your workout but if you do that uh, duration will be shorter so don't forget three to five minutes is needed to replenish your phosphocreatine stores completely. The lactic acid system or anaerobic glycolysis, it's the high intensity exercise lasting one to two minutes or 30 minutes to two minutes, 30 seconds to two minutes. Um, the increased acidity, we talked about this uh, due to the hydrogen ions uh, that is being released to your uh, muscle cell environment which creates that burning sensation and uh, reduces your performance level that plays a role in creating f acute fatigue and also other factors. Aerobic glycolysis which is um, burning your carbohydrates or breaking down carbohydrates with oxygen. It's the moderate to heavy aerobic exercise. So the fatigue is going to be caused by glycogen depletion in your muscles. Uh, liver is not very common, but um, 
because the muscle glycogen is preferred for exercise, high or heavy aerobic exercise, that's the, ma the major factor, muscle glycogen depletion and low blood glucose. Also dehydration. If you don't have enough water, we talked about it in the last slide of the first part of this lecture, that water is needed in chemical reactions to hydrolyze or break down the, the high energy phosphate bond to create or release that energy. So dehydration is, is a big factor. Oxidative system, well, for mild and aerobic exercise, energy supplies are not really limiting or not creating fatigue. But there are other factors which I'm not going to discuss for the sake of this chapter, but just know that the energy supplies are not the reason for developing fatigue. So in summary, we talked about kilocalories for, uh, in the first part for measuring the energy intake or output. Uh, intake is the food you covered with the nutrition uh, instructor and the output is how many calories you burn during exercise which we covered in the fitness portion. ATP, we just know that it's your currency of energy in your body. If you don't have any ATP, you will die. Uh, Rigo mortis is the, uh, another name uh, for ATP depletion completely in your body. And you, can't, you just, you know, your tissues freeze. So that's the immediate source of energy and it's the currency of energy. We talked about that. And there is three systems to replenish ATP in the body. We talked about those. And the inability to provide energy at needed rate is going to cause fatigue. And you will not be able to sustain the intensity of the exercise that you are uh, performing. So that's all for the energy chapter. I hope you had a good time and I hope you understood this. If you have any questions, we will cover them in the uh, Zoom section next week. Thank you for listening.